Hi, and welcome back to Miami Television News. I'm Chase Engel. And I'm Rachel Tracy. This week, we welcome two people who have both had incredible success within their professions, one in baseball, the other in journalism. Pete Rose, most well known for having the most hits in Major League Baseball and for being one of the greatest players to ever come through Cincinnati. And Paul Doggerty, who has been a sports columnist for the Cincinnati Inquirer for more than 20 years. The two have come to Miami University to speak about sports ethics and media coverage of athletes off the field. We are both very excited to have you here and welcome to Oxford. Now, <coughs> I want to get to the question of what why you guys are here? What's the point of this series uh, event that you're doing? Uh, the, the importance of sports ethics and off the field reporting. What does this visit to Miami mean to the both of you? Well, it's a lot of fun for me. and uh, <clears throat> I must say, you called me. I didn't call you. <laughs> 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 but it's always fun to come to campuses and uh, Youth of America is here. And, and I know what you guys, I don't know what you guys are going through, going through college. I never had that experience, I, although I wish I had. Uh, Paul, of course, is a college guy, but, uh, you know, I'm from Cincinnati. I've been here many times before. Uh, I've been to football games here. Uh, actually, I've been to baseball games here, but uh, it's always a pleasure to come back. I, I, for me, this is, this is a treat. You know, I, I didn't tell them before I, I, I signed the contract, but I probably would have done this for nothing. <laughs> they could, if it held out just a little while longer, I might have. But, but it, I mean, yeah. to, to get to be with Pete, <laughs> uh, one of the greatest, greatest storytellers ever, and we're going we're gonna to hit on a lot of topics tonight that I think will be of a lot of interest to a lot of people, not only here, but, but nationwide. Did that check clear the bank yet? I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about it. Perfect. Well, I want to get into a topic uh, that I'm, you know, both of you, I'm sure, prepared for the All-Star Game this summer, which was a big summer for Cincinnati, of course. Yeah. Um, my first question is to you, Mr. Rose. What was it like to walk onto the field of Great American Ballpark and have a standing ovation from the crowd? Tell me what you were feeling at that time. Uh, it's kind of goosebumpy for me, um, you know, being from Cincinnati uh, and always at the ballpark, it seems like, whether it was Riverfront or Crawley Field or now Great American. And, but one thing you never expect as a player, what the, what the reaction of the audience is going to be. Uh, it's just like when I broke the record in 1985 uh, I got a nine minute staying ovation. That's a long ovation. Yes, it is. And when you get something like that, uh, uh, you start thinking about a lot of people that are responsible for you being there but aren't with us anymore. And the same thing happened at the All Star game. Uh, I'm not going to be there for one for my, my dad and my, and my high school coach and my little league coaches and my uncle who signed me into a contract or. And my minor league managers have all passed away, and my manager Sparky Anderson has passed away. So you're not going to be there if none of those people uh, weren't part of your life. And you start thinking about that. Fortunately for me, it wasn't that long of an ovation. You know, it was longer for Joe because he could hardly walk. So it took longer for Joe to walk out there, and it did for me. You know, if I'd have crawled out there, it, it probably <laughs> would have brought tears in my eyes. But it, it's, you know, any time I can walk on the field with Joe Morgan and Johnny Bench or Tony Perez or, in this case, Barry Larkin, it's a lot of fun for me because they were great players, great individuals, teammates, and part of history. Now, what was your perspective of the weekend? Because as a journal as journalist, like I assume the – the sports aspect of it was really big over the weekend. So, like, how did you decide, like, whom to interview, when to start interviews, and, like, how did that shape your own stories? Uh, I, I thought the story was the city itself, to tell mm -hmm. you the truth. It's a wonderful game. It's a wonderful event. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's a marketing tool. It, it's what the host city wants to present itself as. Um, it, it was a wonderful thing that Todd Frazier, hometown guy, <laughs> wins the home run derby. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have written a better script. I, I took it from that angle. Th this is where Cincinnati is today as opposed to where it was 10 years ago or 15 years ago in a, in a much better place, I think, for the most part. I, I wrote about it more from that aspect than the game aspect. They play 81 other games there a year. The game itself is sort of like the hors d'oeuvre to get to the marketing and the showing off of the city, you know, and that's, that's kind of the way I looked at it. I thought, I thought Major League Baseball in the Cincinnati Reds uh, did a wonderful job the whole yeah, three did. days. Mm -hmm. You know, the, uh, did. the, the, uh, uh, the, the young guys playing on Sunday and, of course, the celebrities playing in the game. Then, of course, the home run derby that, that Todd Frazier won. Then the game itself and, and having uh, Hank Aaron there and Sandy Koufax and Johnny Bench and Willie Mays and, and the franchise four. I mean, it, uh, it was, it was uh, quite, a, quite a three or four days for the Queen City. Perfect. Um, uh, Mr. Rose, my next question is for you. 
Uh, Actually, my dad was Mr. Rhodes. I'm yeah. Pete. <laughs> Pete, perfect. Yeah. I, I can do that. So, Pete, uh, you came here tonight to speak about sports ethics and the ethics in all major league sports. Now, as journalism students and media students, we know what ethics means in the media world, but what does ethics mean in sports to you? Well, uh, I think you have to abide by the rules, which I didn't uh, at one time, and you have to play the game the way it's supposed to be played within the rules. And uh, the most important thing about playing the game uh, is to win the game within the rules. And I think that's what, uh, uh, that's what you, have to, you have to have pride about the way you approach the game. Because, see, there's one thing I never did as a player and never would do as a player or a manager. <clears throat> I, never treat, I never cheated the fans. You know, you have to understand when you play in a baseball game, football, basketball, whatever it is, hockey. You've got a good hockey team here in, in Miami. But uh, uh, you, want, you want every seat to have a person on it every night. And you have to give them a reason, if they're there on Monday, to come back on a Tuesday. And you can't ever cheat the fan. The players have to understand that. What's the sense of playing a baseball game if you open up the, the stadium and 5,000 people show up and you've got 35,000 empty seats? It drives me crazy when I, when I turn on the TV every night and watch the Cardinals and every game is sold out. Then I flip it over to the Reds and they got 28,000 instead of 40,000. And we're the same size as St. Louis. We got a better history than St. Louis. And uh, just little things like that drive me crazy. And uh, you know, when I was in Philadelphia, we sold out every game. That's a big city, I know that. Dodgers sell out every game. Mets sell out every game. Pittsburgh's doing well now. You know, you, you want, but there again, you have to give people a reason. And this year, the Reds are not giving the people a reason to come back. Now, the Bengals are good. So a lot of people that would buy Reds tickets are going to buy Bengal tickets if there's any left. Although I noticed, Paul, that they weren't even sold out yesterday. It was what, not. Well, I don't understand that. You're, you're coming off of a big win against Oakland, and you're playing San Diego, who come off of a big win. When are they going to sell the stadium? The TV out is really good these days, Pete. You might have noticed that. <laughs> Well, that was a it's, perfect day, though. I think. It, you, it was talking about replays. No, everything. The TV experience. They're trying to reproduce the TV experience at the ballpark, at the stadium these days. Now this is good. I like this conversation because our next question for you mm -hmm. is, uh, what is the what it makes sports reporting so unique compared to other types of journalism? Um, well, I'm a columnist. I, I report, but I write opinion. I don't think there's anything different about sports reporting. Yeah, the, the same principles are there, you know, tell the truth as best you can, ask good questions, try to get good answers, write it accurately. All that stuff is stuff that any, any writer is going to do in, 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 in a newspaper or journalistic setting. Uh, for, for my purposes, it allows me to write. I'm not just a reporter. I, I, I can write. I have opinion. I can get goofy sometimes. I can, I can make people laugh or try. I can make people cry or try. Uh, in that respect, sports is, is, is great because sports is human, you know, sports is emotion. Uh, guys are very uh, human. Pete's a great example, you know? May not be the greatest human being of all time, but he's a great human, you know what I mean? <laughs> that makes sense? I disagree with some things he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, it, allow, it gives you a little space to write, to try to find out who these people are, what makes them tick, uh, and I think uh, People like to watch a lot of reality television. Sports is reality television. And I, I, I like to be a part of that, and I think that uh, that's the reason I'm still in it. You know? Well, you know, there again, there's, uh, Paul's got integrity. Uh, there's some writers that don't have integrity. You know, and they just write whatever they want to write and don't care whose uh, feet they step on or things like that. But uh, we as athletes know the guys with integrity. We know the guys we can trust. I think that's what an athlete wants more from a writer than anything, that he can trust what he says is what he's going to write, not what he thought he said, and, and that's what he wrote. I mean, so, uh, but there, you've got guys like Paul who's got all the integrity in the world, and, and there's disagreements. Players have disagreements with him. I had disagreements with him. I think five or six years ago, he hated me. Okay, no, but I, I, I kind of got him on. Have. I kind of got him on my side now. No. You know, you know, because because I cooperate with him. He cooperates with me, and and if if you say the sky's blue, he's going to write the sky's blue. Mm -hmm. It's not white, and that's all you want from a writer. Is the truth. <laughs> Couldn't so agree more. Yes, fantastic. Now I have a more of a serious question for you, Pete. Oh, those other ones weren't serious. <laughs> <laughs> now uh, seeing other professional athletes uh, charged with 
uh, crimes like manslaughter and rape and domestic violence and then becoming suspended from your sport uh, for a very limited time for them, uh, maybe two, three, four games while you were banned from baseball for your entire life. Uh, for example, for Ray Rice, who's a running back for the Baltimore Ravens, suspended for only two games after a domestic violence charge, but then after the video leaked out, he got suspended for the entire year, and now he's no longer playing in the NFL. So what are your thoughts on the different uh, leniencies between well, the NFL I, I, and the I don't look at it like that. I, I don't look at it like right that. Every case is a different case, okay? Uh, I'm not going to sit here in Oxford, Ohio and whine about me being suspended because mm -hmm. I'm the one that screwed up, okay? I'm the one that screwed up. I'm the one paying the consequences. Uh, A-Rod's a different case. Barry Bond's a different case. Ray Rice is a different case. Whoever may have a case in sports is a different case. I don't worry about them and hopefully they don't worry about me. Uh, you know, I've been suspended a long time, but uh, I made a mistake and I'm, I'm, I'm paying the consequences. I, uh, if I'm ever given a second chance, I'll be the happiest guy in the world. That's the way you look at it. You know, I'm an American. This is America. You get a second chance. You know, uh, uh, the last time I checked, the guy who shot the Pope got a second chance. Nixon got a second chance. Clinton got a second chance. And I won't need a third chance. But hopefully, uh, people will learn not, any, not only at Miami University, will for, learn from my mistakes that they won't make the same mistakes. So you can use my case as uh, something that helps people. That's the way I look at it, because you can't change what happened. It's already, it's, it's history. It's in the books. It's on my resume. I can't change it. I wish I could, but I can't change it. But we can change it by not talking about it today. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, I have a question for you about Miami sports. Uh, what are your thoughts on Miami sports right now, and what can we do to in Provide programs. I know that you had just recently wrote an article about us and the tradition with UC. Right. Uh, it's a really popular one on campus, I hear. Yes, yeah. <laughs> really and, well received. Yes, very well say, received. <laughs> yes. What did you say? And we had you quoted as saying, uh, Miami's gotten a little too full of itself. We're Correct. Miami and you are not. So I didn't know if you had some response to that at all. Uh, response to, to what? To what I what To I the wrote? article, to our programs in general, um, how we can improve? Uh, the, 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 those words were conveyed to me by several people who know the programs here pretty well. And it was a kind of a universal opinion that, that Miami thinks highly of itself. And there's nothing wrong with that, obviously. I'd want to go to a place where they thought highly of themselves, too. But, but in doing so, had allowed some of, of the stuff that brings in great athletes to slip. The facilities, for example. Um, uh, the aura of the place seem, seem to suggest an air of privilege. Sometimes you get athletes who, who are kind of turned off by that. You got blue collar kids that want to go to a place where they feel like they fit in. I was told that they don't feel like they, they fit in the way they used to around here. Uh, on the other side of it, you, you are doing great work with the facilities. The money the bed gave and, and the families have given, you're turning into great stuff. Athletes like facilities. I know when I was uh, back in Dallas, back in my youth covering college sports, and I, I'd go to the weight room at the University of Oklahoma, and it made the Bengals weight room look like some junior high gym. You know, the athletes are impressed by stuff like that. You're on your way now with the facilities. Um, I don't know that Miami will ever be a big time football place. That's not what you're about. It shouldn't be what you're about. What my point was, one, that the rivalry was not a rivalry anymore, given that you'd lost nine out of the last 10 games and now 10 out of the last 11, even though you played really well the other day. Um, but it needs something more than tradition. Rivalry means one team has a chance to win any given year. I don't know that you can honestly say in the last 10 years, other than Saturday, of course, that Miami's really had a chance to be a partner in this rivalry. The, the average loss is by 25 yeah. in the last 10 years. Since Ben left, it's not been great. Um, and that was my point. Rivalries are more than just, well, this is the way we've always done it. They're, they're more than just tradition. There has to be competition with the tradition. It could be worse because uh, Kentucky just lost to Florida on Saturday for the 29th straight year. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, could be worse. Yes. There's one thing that can change everything around at this university. You know what it's called? W-I-N, win. <laughs> Winning okay. creates, a, eliminates a lot of problems. Yes, it does. <laughs> yes. Now, Whether you're a football coach, a basketball coach, a baseball coach, why do you win at hockey and you don't win at football? Why do you win at hockey and you don't win at basketball? 
couldn't answer that question. I'm not here, so I can't answer that question either. But you know you can win because the hockey team is really good, correct? They are yes. very good. Didn't they win the championship last year? No. Didn't they win their league? Yes. yes. Okay. So, well, that's championship. <laughs> <laughs> I live in Las Vegas. We don't get no news out there. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's go ahead and leave Miami and try to talk about Cincinnati sports in general. Like, what are your thoughts on the Bengals, on the Reds, or any other, other professional sports in um. the region? Okay, it's a pretty broad question. Yeah. How much time we got? Uh, Go ahead and talk about Ohio State. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Bengals are for real. I, I've said that since uh, since the spring. Uh, they, they have an offense that's going to be very difficult for lots of people to defend this year. They have too many good players on the field at one time. I was just telling Pete, uh, Jeremy Hill, the running back, their best running back, the guy who led the NFL in rushing the last eight games of the season last year, fumbled twice first half out they can bring in Gio Bernard Gio Bernard gains 120 yards I mean that's the kind of talent they have on offense um, defense not quite at that level but defense is good uh, the the big problem that they've had is getting over that playoff hump uh, and, and we'll all hold our breaths around here until they do um, Andy Dalton still is a guy who makes you a little bit skeptical because he hasn't won in the playoffs and if you don't win in the playoffs as an NFL quarterback you're you're not elite uh, and so we'll wait and see. But I think they're very good. I think the talent is there to take them a long way. The Reds, uh, the talent is not there to take them a long way. But they, they hope that the trades that they've made uh, recently will, will get them back on the road to succeeding. And, and we'll, we'll see about that. I'm always, I've always been one who's been suspicious of prospects because that's why they're prospects. That's, that's like Major League Baseball speak for ain't done nothing yet. And we'll see how all these prospects that the Reds have acquired do. I, I think it's a three to five year job for them, um, but they certainly have a couple of key parts in place with you know, Joey Votto, Todd Frazier, Devin Mezzarocco, uh, Jay Bruce if they decide to keep him, uh, Chapman if they decide to keep him. They've got parts. They, the, the parts just aren't, uh, aren't very good right now. They don't equal the whole, and it may take a little while. See, I think something needs to be changed in Cincinnati, and it happens to a lot of organizations. It may have happened to you people up here. They need an attitude change. You need more of a positive attitude. You know, if you lose for a long period of time, you become negative. You become a losing team. Uh, we, we've watched the Mets become a winning team the second half of the season. Joe Madden has changed the attitude around in Chicago, where the Cubs are relevant now. They're a pretty good ball club. Uh, Terry Collins has turned, uh, you know, four months ago, people wanted his head as the Met manager. Now he's up for manager of the year because he's having a great year. So it, it, I, I don't I want to hear Paul because I don't, I'm a Cincinnati Red fan. I don't want to hear we're going to be OK in three or five years. OK, well, I'll buy my season ticket three or four <laughs> years from now. You know, I, because the way baseball is structured today, you don't have to make that many changes to be a contender. We've seen it over the years with a lot of teams. And, so, you know, certain teams do it right and other teams don't do it right. You know, it don't matter what, you know, that's like injuries. I don't want to hear injuries as an excuse for any team because there hasn't been a team this year with more injuries than the St. Louis Cardinals. And they got the best record in baseball. They lost three or four potential all-star players at one time this year. Okay? One of them, Wainwright, for the whole year. Holiday was out. Uh, Lynn was out. Uh, the first baseman was out for eight weeks. So I don't want to use the excuse, well, we had injuries. Because you had to bring other people in and they had to do the job. And it's up to the organization, the president of the team, or the general manager of the team, to put those pieces together. And Paul's right. When you got Phillips, you got Votto, you got Bruce, Mezzarocco, you know, Cozart's coming back from an injury. Suarez had a great year for him this year, a shortstop filling in for him. You know, you got a lot of potential there. You got the best closer in the league in Chapman. So you don't have to make that many household changes. You shouldn't have to make three to five years of changes to be competitive again. And uh, the last 36 games of the year, the, this past season, with two more weeks to go, the Reds are going to start a rookie pitcher. It's never happened in the world of baseball before. So hopefully those rookies in the starting rotation, five guys, will have better years next year. Some of them will digress probably. Some of them will be, get better and better. Uh, you wish they'd all get better as a Cincinnati fan, but you just hope the two or three of them really build off of what they did this year and learn from their experiences this year. Attitude. It's all about attitude. Absolutely. I want to take a bit of a flashback for you. Uh, you were both a player and a manager for the Reds. Um, 
So what is the difference in preparing for both of those, preparing as a player and then preparing your team as a manager? Well, fortunately for me, I had to do them both for about three years. I had to be a player manager. And what happens, uh, uh, will that ever happen again? I don't think so. Uh, here's the reason it won't. Because uh, a manager's job, it really has three jobs. You know, one job is to take care of his players. Uh, his other job is to take care of the press. And his other job is keep his skills honed. Okay? So you can't back off from taking care of your players. You certainly can't back off from cooperating with the press. I just didn't have enough time to continuously practice to where I needed to practice as a player. Uh, but there again, uh, it's all about players. You know, you know what makes a good manager or a good coach in football? One thing, good players. Good players that play good, not good players that play mediocre, or not mediocre players that play poor. You know, you just, everybody has a, a different category they're in. You know, you can be great, you can be so-so, and you can be bad. You just want the so-so players to play so-so. You want the great players to play great. And if you put the right team together, you're going to win. But don't ever think that every, every manager in baseball that I know don't know any more about baseball than I do. And I don't know any more about baseball than them. But sometimes a guy knows more about his team than the other guys know about their team. And that's usually successful for a manager of a baseball team. But you got to have great players that play good if you want to win. It's nothing about the manager or the coach. You know, your, your, your football team lost that game on Saturday by three, I believe. It wasn't because of the coach, okay? It was because of the players. The, 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 uh, the Bearcats won because of the players, not because of the coach. He didn't now coach your coach. Or your coach wasn't undercoached by his coach. It's the players. And, and you have to understand that. It's, you got to get good players that play good. It's, it's, it's about putting that mindset in their, in, in their head where they think they're going to win. If you don't think you're going to win, you're not going to win. You're not going to win. If you don't think you're going to pass the test, you're going to flunk it. It's pretty simple. It's, 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 it's life experiences. It's not rocket science. Everybody wants to make a rocket science. Really not. What well, great advice. Thank you so much. Now, I couldn't go this interview without asking you one of my personal questions for you. Uh, where did you get your nickname, Charlie Hustle, one of my favorite all-time nicknames in all of sports? Um, it's a long story, but I'll make it short. Um, <laughs> you will. <laughs> I was a non-roster player in 1963, and we went to uh, Fort Lauderdale to play the Yankees. And my day was complete. When I say a non-roster player, every big league baseball team has 40 men on the roster to go to spring training. And certain guys are invited to go to spring training because they had really good years the year before, and I was one of those guys, which was really fun and good for me because I got extra big league meal money for an extra three weeks before the minor leaguers reported spring training. And my day was complete, and we're in Fort Lauderdale, and we had to take a four-hour bus ride back to Tampa, and we had a coach named Mike Reba, and I was going to go do my running, take my shower, and wait for the bus. He says, stick around. You never know. You might get in the game. So I stuck, uh, stuck around, and all of a sudden, they needed a pinch runner in the ninth inning, and I pinch run, and a guy hit a, a ball to the left to the left fielder by a step and a half, and I went in the third and did a head first slide. Then the next guy popped up to Tony Kubek, who was backpedaling to left field, and he caught it, and I tagged up, and I did another head first slide in the home, and I was safe. We won the game two to one. And Mickey Mantle was then talking to Whitey Ford after the game was over, and he said, did you see that Charlie Hustle beat us today? And the next day in the New York paper, it said, Charlie Hustle beats the Yanks. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. That's so pretty interesting. Went, I, I didn't even know that. If I, <laughs> if I have went took my shower, I'd yeah. have been Charlie wow. Russell. Charlie Russell. <laughs> That's hilarious. It's funny how things happen, yeah. huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. Timing's everything. Do people still call you that? Sure. Occasionally? I've been called a lot worse. <laughs> <laughs> well. No, I'm just kidding. So, um, actually, this is our last question for you guys. This is for both of you. Already? Um, yeah. What's next for you guys? Do you guys have another, do you have another book coming out? What's next for you? Anything? Uh, I'm working on a movie right now. Mm. I'm trying to do a movie. Uh, that would be followed probably by a book, but uh, I'm on Fox now, man. i got a, a TV career now. It's fun, man. I, I get to go out to uh, Fox Studios on Pico in Los Angeles and sit in the green room and watch all 15 games, and I get to get on the air and talk about what I just watched. It's right up my alley. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so much fun. Uh, uh, we're covering the World Series this year. Fox has the World Series, so I'll probably be going to the World Series. 
we'll pick certain playoff games in October. I think I'm working 18 days in October, which is fun for me because uh, it's, uh, it's reporting, it's talking about something that I love, and that's a game of baseball. Awesome. What are you going to do, Paul? <laughs> I, just fin I just finished uh, a book on my daughter. just came out in March, a memoir of uh, raising my daughter, who is now 25, almost 26, has Down syndrome. Uh, just got married in June. Um, oh. Graduated high school after four years of college. Um, and is living independently with, with her husband at the moment. So we're right in the middle of, of marketing and, and publicizing that trying to get some national traction. It's done very well locally, nationally not so great yet, but uh, it's early. So I'm <laughs> trying to keep my day job while marketing a book. So if you guys know anybody that wants to buy an inspiring book, I read, read, read Pete's when he I writes read, it. <laughs> I read that article that you wrote about your daughter. That was a great article. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's what I'm doing now, and there's, there are other books in the future, and I'm always open to, you know, Anybody who wants to throw money my way to write something, I'm just a mercenary, yeah. I can't wait to read it myself. Now, what's in store for you two guys? What, what's, your, <laughs> what's your ambitions? Uh, Are we going to see you on the local news? Uh, perhaps just going to school here, making my grades. I know Bill O'Reilly. You want me to call him? <laughs> yes, please. Please. <laughs> <laughs> I know Don Lemon, too. <laughs> what do you want, Fox or CNN? <laughs> Either. <laughs> Well, that's going to be it for us, but we have some questions from the studio audience, so if any of you guys have some questions, do not be afraid to ask. Yes, ma'am. Um, I am Bay Area, San Francisco, born and raised, so... Um, next I, year, next year, babe. I grew up five minutes from Oakland, 10 minutes from San Francisco, so I grew up going to both those games. Um, I noticed the fan base in um, San Francisco is obviously a lot heavier. Um, as a journalist, what's the difference um, between reporting um, at a fan base like Oakland where it's quiet and then a fan base that's so heavy? I mean, in San Francisco, there's it's, it's almost like going to a movie. Like, I mean, everything is so exaggerated. Um, and as a player, you know, what's, what's it like playing at a stadium that's quiet versus a stadium that's all rolled up? No, you're going you're gonna to have to translate. I, I didn't get about half of that. No, she wants to know what's what's the difference in covering a team like San Francisco that okay. sells out every night, like the Giants, and Oakland that sells about four thousand tickets. Oh, I, it doesn't make a lot of difference to me. I mean, I don't mean to sound candid or cold about it, but I get paid no matter how many people are there. It's it, it suits my purposes somehow. If the excitement translates through the entire season, you know what I mean, and there's a great storyline, and everybody's into it, more people want to read what you write. You know, they want to hear what you have to say. That, that part of it's great, but in terms of, of whether there's 10,000 people there or, or 50, it, it doesn't really change how I approach anything. I got a, I got a take on this. That uh, First of all, um, <coughs> I'm not a big supporter of Moneyball. You know, everybody talks about Moneyball yeah. because uh, I support winning, and uh, Moneyball don't win. I mean, when's the last time Oakland won a World, World Series? Uh, Sure, Moneyball works here for the general manager. You go and say, well, I saved you a million dollars by trading Cespedes during the All-Star game over to Boston. Well, did you win me a, a division? Did you win me a pennant? Moneyball is good for the owner, but it's not good for the fans, I don't think. You have an opinion on that, Paul? I, I think Moneyball worked when, when they had Mulder, Hudson, and Zito. Yeah. That's why Moneyball was so good. They had three guys capable of winning 20 games apiece. Other than that, I... I, I understand the theory, but I, I'm with you, Pete. I don't necessarily buy it. I'd rather have Cardinal Ball, <laughs> or I'd rather have Yankee Ball. They won 27 World Series championships, and they're in, in the possibility of. Uh, but as a player, you know, you rather go to a stadium that's got 50,000 as opposed to it's got 10. It just makes you feel more appreciated as a player. You know, and, and I've been I've been on both sides. I, hell, I played a game one night in Chicago. They had 1,029 people at the game. And I left 50 passes. 5% <laughs> of the people were there to see me. I mean, but th then you go to Dodger Stadium every night. Every time we go to Dodger Stadium, 52,400 people at the game. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, just like today. I'm, I'm, some teams sell out every game. Some teams never sell out. You know, they had bobblehead day last Saturday in Cincinnati. They gave out 41,137 bobbleheads. I think that was the second largest crowd of the year. Was it? 
Was it other than a bobblehead day? Or was it opening day? Opening day. Okay. And bobblehead day was the same day the football started. So uh, college football started. And don't forget, the day that game was played, the Reds were 29 games out of first place. So it was you know, your bobblehead, though. It looked just like me. <laughs> <laughs> same as the other eight you had. <laughs> <laughs> I have more bobbleheads than bobble itself. <laughs> we are but they sell. You give somebody something, they go to the ballpark. Yeah. You know. I don't know if they do it here. Do you ever have T-shirt giveaways or hat giveaways or you know Red Hawk giveaways? Something. You know. We're gonna have one more question from the audience. That's it. Yep. Two questions. Clint Combs, Miami Television News. This question's for Pete. Take us back to 1963. Your first game, you were 0 for 3. Your next two games against Philadelphia, you're 0 for 4. Finally, at Pittsburgh, you got your first hit. What was going through your mind? What was your mindset trying to get that first I hit? Know. It, it doesn't matter back then. I mean, you know, uh, when you're a big leaguer for the first time, especially in Cincinnati, you're starting to, you know, I never realized, I'm still trying to figure out <laughs> why we played Pittsburgh on opening day. Then we went to Philadelphia for a couple games and back to Cincinnati for Pittsburgh again. Uh, I, I never did. You know, because I, I knew I was 0 for 11 or 0 for 12. Uh, you know, and when you just make the team as, as someone who wasn't supposed to make the team, you kind of concern, concern yourself because you don't want to get some back to the minors. And then, you know, I only hit 273 my first year, but I scored over 100 runs. And I had great teammates. I had Frank Robinson and Beta Penson and Johnny Edwards and Gordy Coleman and people like that. So, uh, and the manager liked me, Freddie Hutchinson, our manager. He, he gave me a job, actually, yeah. and uh, God rest his soul. And, and he got to see me win rookie of the year, but he never got to see me get 200 hits. He never got to see me make the all-star team. Uh, he never got to see me win a batting title. And he's really the reason why uh, I've become a big league baseball player, because he had, he had confidence in me. And uh, I remember I wasn't nervous until about a half hour before game time. And don't forget, I was born about three miles from Crosley Field. And the guy from Cincinnati Enquirer came down and wanted to get a picture of my mom and my dad and me before uh, you know I took the field. And it kind of woke me up where I'm at. Geez, I'm, I'm starting second baseman for the Cincinnati Reds. I've been wanting to do this for 22 years, and now it's a reality. So it kind of it kind of wakes you up, you know, when you when you're a young kid and you make the big leagues, you're on cloud nine, man. It's just uh, it's all gravy. And all of a sudden, it's a reality. It's uh, I didn't have time to be nervous. I walked on four straight pitches the first time up. I, I, I don't think I'd have swung if he threw me a strike. <laughs> it didn't matter. We'd never know. Well, we'd like to thank you guys for your responses. They were wonderful. Uh, so thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter at MiamiTelevisionNews.com. Thanks for watching.